today's video it's all about solving a problem and this is one of the problems that my viewers seem to have and that problem is I can't get coal dust so it is a problem so what I'll be doing I'll be using these three small patterns and I will be using sawdust as a substitute for coal dust so we'll see what happens there and it might be a major breakthrough now with all the other castings I'm pouring today like these I'll be using coal dust as a facing sand now I bet a lot of you are wondering why I didn't make all the moulds with sawdust well the simple reason is I've never used sawdust before I don't know what it's going to do so it's better off to make one mould with sawdust than the lot otherwise they could be all a complete failure now these castings here machined well last time with the disc brake rotors but that was the first time so I'll pour them again and machine them and we'll see just how soft they are to machine this is the piece of wood that I'll be using to make the sawdust with an electric saw it's just a cheap piece of chipboard it's actually made out of sawdust glued together and what I'll be doing I'll be trimming off the edges so I won't contaminate it with uh, the charcoal so we'll see how we go and I'll give you a close-up view of the section so this is the side view of the chipboard it's just sawdust glued together so my thinking was if I'm going to make sawdust I might as well cut up some sawdust Here's our pile of sawdust. As you can see, there's a few lumps and bits and pieces in there. So to get a consistent size to put in with the sand, we've got to run it through the sieve. Before I sieve the sawdust, I forgot to mention, if you're going to use wood, don't use green wood. If you ever had a fire like I have and you had green timber, you throw it on there, it is loaded with moisture and put it on the fire and nothing much happens so the timber you need has got to be really bone dry if you use the green timber sawdust it's going to give off a lot of steam and you don't really want that to happen I've put the sawdust through the sieves once and I'll show you something what happens I'll put it through twice and there's still a few lumps in there as you can see there's still some lumps in there so if you do that a few times you probably get the finer chunks of sawdust it's probably a bit coarse but uh, coal dust is very fine so another way of doing this is if you've got a sanding wheel with emery paper and you could probably make some really fine dust but that's fairly good sometimes you can run it through a few times and you get the more finer sawdust now comes the very important question how much sawdust do I add to the sand well seeing I've never done this before I'm giving a guesstimate so what happens is with coal dust I use about 4% so what I'm going to do I'm going to put a little bit more than I add in coal dust so I'm going to go for 5% sawdust and we'll see what happens this is my sawdust facing sand it's all been mixed up with it and what you'll find unusual when I make a mould with it and you'll see in the video it'll be a light coloured sand for the facing sand now normally I would use coal dust sand so it's very dark so you'll see the exact opposite you'll see a very light coloured sand for facing and the backing sand will be a very dark colour because it's got the coal dust in it an actual interesting thing I've forgotten to say was I was going to only make one mould with sawdust sand 
but that's a very good reason for it as well because I'm going to make exactly the same casting with coal dust sand in the same melt and you'll be able to compare the surface finish and see how they look like and also how they will machine. I'm very interested to see exactly what the sawdust sand is going to be like. The casting the finish. Well, doesn't half look bad. Really good, actually. I think there might be some future developments with using sawdust. I might try it again and again, see what happens. Here we go. Nice set of cylinders there. We look forward to machining them. Here we are. 
we're now at the comparison test. Here we've got two castings. One is using coal dust and the facing sand. And the other one is using sawdust. And let's see if you can see the difference. They look very, very similar. In fact, they're virtually impossible to tell. So what I'll get you to do, you can have a good look at those castings and then I'll flip them over and I'll mark them with a pen on the other side, one with a C and one with an S. C is for coal dust and S is for sawdust. And we'll see if you can see the difference and put it in the comments. So here's one. That one is sawdust. And that one is coal dust. So as you can see, it's very hard to see. That's what coal dust is supposed to do. And it seems that the sawdust is probably just as good as coal dust. This is the next test. I'll be cutting these two covers off. Here are the smallest castings are produced in this pour. And we'll see what they machine like in the lathe. We'll see if they've got any chilling on the edges. One thing I've noticed with the sawdust sand, you'll see the top edges from here and here, that's the parting line. And you'll see very little is broken. It's given a very clean definition around the edges. This is the second cover. I've taken a facing cut of 0.1 of a millimetre, a tenth of a millimetre. And you can just see, because this has got a boss on it, there's a bit of shrinkage, so a little bit more, and I'll be able to machine that flat. All the castings have been machined to see if they've got any chill and as you can see with these two cylinders they were the same result as last time absolutely perfect with no chill do you remember what I said in previous videos and probably this one as well I've said I like to cast a wide variety of shapes and sizes of castings to see what will happen and also to identify the problem areas and I have identified the problem area so what happens is you'll see with these three castings the smaller the casting gets with disc brake rotors the more problems you'll have with chills so you need to have a very good wedge test so continuing on these are the smallest three castings that I poured this time round and they've all got a degree of chilling on them but they were far less than they were last time when I cast these covers and I had a worse wedge test but I've discovered something very interesting we'll see with this one here what happened is I machined them at normal speed and what would happen is the tool would bounce over the chill spot and leave a ridge so what I've done I slowed it down a long way probably about 300 rpm to about 100 rpm or even slower so what happens is it's quite easy to machine the chill spot and I'll show you how good it turns out if you go across to there I can't even get the feeler gauge to go in there and this feeler gauge is 0.025 millimeters the smallest feeler gauge that I've got so I'll show you a comparison then if you machine them too fast it's got a raised area on there which is unacceptable because you've got to put a gasket in there so you see with here you see it coming out going through so when you machine the castings if they have chill you can salvage the casting but you've got to slow the speed a long way down 
Now this one here I never machined last time because these two castings were both chilled badly. So this one I've left but I used that method. I've slowed it right down and see so we can do it there. You can see, I don't know whether you can see that, but there's some chilling there, varying thickness all the way around. Normally I would have thrown this casting out, but when you go across to here, the feeler gauge will not go in there. So, this casting is quite acceptable. You can get round the chilling. I've drilled the holes, I've machined it, it's got a lip there that lines up with the cylinder. So it works quite well, but you have to slow the lay down a lot. And what I found was you can machine that chilled area with a high speed steel tool, but you have to be prepared to sharpen it maybe once or twice. It's better off to use a tip tool to get down to there and then put a sharp corner there with a high speed steel tool. While we're on the subject of chills in iron castings, Last night I was watching another YouTuber called AIDS Workshop. Now he got some castings from a commercial foundry and they were for a model steam engine kit. And when he machined the flywheel rim, oh boy, it was hard as. So even commercial foundries have problems with chills in castings. So what I'll do, I'll put a link in the description for that video. It's a very interesting one to watch. If you are wondering how I came up with the idea of using sawdust as a substitute for coal dust, well watch the next video clip and you'll see how I've spilt iron onto a wooden plank that's below the moulding box. It just bursts into flame. And this is what happens when you add coal dust to sand. When the molten iron flows over it, it bursts into flame. But there's a bit more than that. I'll explain a little bit later. When molten iron flows over sand that contains a combustible material like coal dust or sawdust, it actually lifts the metal up or it pushes the metal away from the sand. Now it doesn't matter if it's the cope or the drag or whatever position, it pushes the molten metal away. So what happens is it doesn't stick to the sand. It makes it easier to get out when you shake out the mould. But that brings up another question I get asked all the time. Everyone says, can you put in powdered charcoal or graphite into the sand? Well, yes and no. It's mostly no. What happens? Those materials don't burn as vigorously because they don't have oils or tars and gas in them. And what they do, they can give a good finish, but what they do is they fill up the gaps in the grains in the sand so it gives a smooth surface but it does not work the same way as coal dust or sawdust does. To finish up this video I did get closer to eliminating the chill in those cover castings but it wasn't close enough it did not eliminate the chill completely so for the next time round I'm just going to have to add just a bit more ferrosilicon so it will eliminate all the chill completely and why I want to do that is it's far better to have a casting that's no chill on it than to fiddle around and try and machine a casting with chill in it.